Hey, welcome to Family Church. We are a diverse, spirit-filled, life-giving church, healing hearts, building relationships, and developing leaders. My name is Pastor John Mark. I'm so excited that you've connected to our page today. Be sure to grab a notebook, a pen, a paper, your phone, however you want to take notes and get ready for today's message. So we are in a series called The Stories of Jesus. We're looking at some of the things that Jesus did in his earthly ministry. I made a statement. Uh, I was reading the book of John, and as it closes out, it says that Jesus did so many things that if it was all written down, the world could not contain the books. And I kind of had this introspect, and I was like, oh my gosh, could I even fill a business card up with the things that I've done for God? And this guy has like, couldn't fit the books in the world uh, if we wrote down everything that he did. So I was like, it, we should probably look at some of the things that Jesus did to learn how to have them happen in our own lives. But there's a question that I have, and here's the hook. Here's what I'm trying to make you question today. Is as a believer in Jesus, as a believer in God, we know that God spoke and the world existed. We know that God is able, able, that he can do anything that he wants to do. The problem or the question or, or the uncertainty comes, is he willing to do it for us? Okay, so here's the question. I know that God can do anything that I ask, but is he willing to do it for me? Is God willing to do for me the things that I request of him? And I struggled for this, with this for years. For years I struggled with this. Not because I doubted that God loved me. I always believed God loved me. That's never been a problem in my mind. The problem in my mind was, am I good enough that God would do things for me? Have I lived a good enough life? Will God, listen, we all know it like our kids do something bad and we really don't feel like giving them ice cream right then. And we tell them, if you behave yourself and if you're really, really, really good, then I will give you ice cream. And like, do we serve an ice cream serving God? And I'm like, sometimes we feel like it. That God will only bless me when I do everything perfect and everything well. And for those of you that have been raised in church or have some kind of religious background, that statement might stop you in your tracks. Because you say, of course, God is not willing, not willing to perform acts of love in your life unless you're living perfectly. Or so we'd like to make the statement for everybody else but us. Right? We always want to stand in a place of judgment like, of course God's not going to bless them. Look what they're doing with their life. But you're doing just as evil things in your mind. This was the whole point of the Old Testament. This is the whole point of the Mosaic Law. The Mosaic Law was a perfect set of standards that none of us could live by. And that perfect set of standards was to lead us to Christ. To say that he is the answer. Because we could not possibly fulfill all these things in and of ourselves. I want to share a story with you. In the book of Mark, Mark is the second book of the New Testament. But although Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John are in the New Testament, they are part of the Old Covenant. Okay, we have to understand that, that Jesus did not die on the cross until the end of John. The beginning of Acts starts our new covenant. The book of Acts is written by the author of the book of Luke. Acts is like Luke part two. Okay, now that's post-cross. Jesus dies on the cross. He gives his life. He pays for the sin of the world. So if we read into the book of Acts, we understand those things. But we're going to study Matthew today. And in studying Matthew, we have to understand that we are still under Mosaic law and that Jesus must operate under Mosaic law. And if, G if Jesus ever operated outside of Mosaic law, it would be sin and he would be disqualified to be the Messiah. The only laws that Jesus ever broke were the man-made laws. They call them secondary laws, the laws of the scribes and the elders. Okay, he, he, he would break those laws because he's like, listen, you're trying to make me keep a law that I didn't write. 
All right, let's get into this. That gives us a little background. We understand where we're going. Mark chapter 1, verse 39. I'm reading out of the NIV today. And so he traveled through Galilee, preaching in their synagogues and driving out demons. Wait a second. Where are the demons? In church? <laughs> Why? Whoa, what's up here? Driving out demons from church. All right, we got to break that. We're going to go back and break that down. A man with leprosy came to him and begged him on his knees. What was his posture? On his knees. If you are willing, you can make me clean. Jesus was indignant. And another translation, Jesus moved with compassion. He reached out his hand and touched the man. I am willing, he said, be clean. Immediately the leprosy left him and he was cleansed. Jesus sent him away at once with a strong warning. See that you don't tell anyone, but go show yourself to the priest and offer the sacrifice that Moses commanded for, for your cleansing as a testimony to them. But instead, he didn't do it, disobeyed. Jesus healed him and he disobeyed. Jesus knew he was going to disobey and still healed him. Instead, he went out and began to talk freely, spreading the news as a result, Jesus could no longer enter a town openly, but he stayed outside in lonely places. Yet, the people still came to him from everywhere. Praise God. Let's go ahead and break this down. Mark chapter 1, verse 39. He was preaching in their synagogues throughout all of Galilee and casting out demons. No, this doesn't necessarily mean that the demons were in the church. I just like to poke fun that sometimes there are demons in the church. But here... <laughs> But here's what I love seeing, that people came to church to get help and to be set free. That people knew that church was a safe place to come to get help and be set free. People ought to be able to get set free in church. Listen, if there are churches that people with hurts, habits, and hang-ups can't come to your church because they're not good enough to get set free from, you're missing the point of church. You're missing the point of church. Then all you have is a Bible study for already saved people who think they're perfect. People ought to be able to come to church with their problems and lay them at the feet of Jesus and say, I'm not perfect. I got a whole lot of issues. I got a whole lot of problems that I don't understand. Listen, the only time I understand like people judging other people for being a hypocrite Christian is if you're the kind of Christian who's judging everybody, but you still got problems. Other than that, church is a perfect place for a bunch of people with problems. Because we meet Christ the healer. Christ the healer. We're in a generation today where we have zero tolerance for anything. If someone, no, I'm not going to go there. I'm not going to go there. I'm not going to go there. Mark 1 verse 40. Now a leper came to him. We're not talking about like the cheetah leper. We're talking about a person who has leprosy. Came to him, imploring him, kneeling down on his knees, saying, if you are willing, you can make me clean. I know that you can do this, but I don't know that you're willing to. I know that you're able to, but I don't know what your will is, God. And I wonder if you've ever found yourself in that same situation. I know you can, God. You raise people from the dead, but are you willing to do all the things you promised in the word for me? Because it's so easy to believe that the word will work for someone else, but is it going to work for me? Do you want it for me, God? Do you love me enough? Now, this scenario was not inside the synagogue. We know that for a fact. Because a man in this condition could not go into that synagogue. In fact, a man in this condition was already labeled by the priest unfit for society. Thus is why Jesus says, now go to the priest and show him. Because only the priest could undo that curse or that label. The priest, this, this boggles my mind. It was the pastor's job to tell somebody you're not fit for society. That boggles my mind. 
That boggles my mind that Jesus had to come in and change that. That this man didn't come to the priest and say, man, I'm broken, I'm hurt. And he says, come, be part of the family. No, nope, you're unfit. You're unfit. By coming to Jesus and being in public, he took his life into his own hands because he could have been killed or stoned for being in society. But I want you to notice something. This, lep this man with leprosy came and found Jesus where Jesus was. This man wasn't sitting at home and saying, listen, God, if you're real, then walk by my house and just know that I'm sitting here waiting for you. We try to play those games with God. God, if you're real, God, if it's your will, let the clouds line up. As if he needs to do that. As if he needs to prove to you that he's real. God doesn't need to prove to any of us that he's real. He doesn't have to do that. that we, we've missed the whole point of faith. Faith is not a problem on God's side. Faith is on our side. This man came and found Jesus where he was, and there's just a lot of people who are just waiting for God to do a work in their life. And God is saying, I've given you all authority. I've given you all power. I've given you the authority to tread on serpents and walk on snakes and take up any deadly thing, and it shall by no means harm you. Go do something. Change the world. No, God, you change it. Could you imagine if God went to Joshua and said, hey, Joshua, march around the walls of Jericho and then give a loud shout, and I'll make the walls fall down. And, Jer and Joshua's like, wait, wait, wait. How about you make the walls fall down, then you'll give me something to shout about. But that's how we are. No, God, I'll worship you when you do something great. I'll worship you when I feel your presence. Nine times out of ten, what you receive from God is initiated by you and not from God. It's initiated by you putting yourself in a place to receive from God. If you want to receive something from God, you've got to take steps of faith. Steps of faith. This man in this condition that he had, if he were to be anywhere near a public assembly, he would have to shout with a loud voice, unclean. Unclean! Unclean! That way people knew to step away. Because if you were to touch an unclean person, you yourself became ceremonially unclean. You would then have to go visit the priest who would then take you through a cleansing process to make you clean again. And it could include shaving your head. Both men and women. Shaving your head is part of the cleansing process. Couldn't touch him. Thus, the man says to Jesus, are you willing to make me clean? He didn't say, are you willing to heal me? He was asking, he was making a request based upon his label based upon his ailment, based upon what he believed about himself. I want to throw this out there to you today. If you need help, don't wait for other people to seek you out. If you're part of the local church, then call the church. Don't sit at home and get offended. I was in the hospital, and no one from the church called me. How did we know? Are we supposed to stalk Facebook? And check your status every 32 seconds to see where you're at? How does anybody know where you are? If you're going through a problem and you need help, do what the Bible says in Luke 5.14. If there's anyone who's sick among you, text me. <laughs> text a brother. Call somebody up. Say, yo, I'm in the hospital. Yo, I'm going through something. Call, text Email the elders of the church that they may pray over you and anoint you with oil in the name of the Lord. Don't sit back and get upset that you stopped coming to church and someone was supposed to magically know you're not here. Like, just think about that for a second. How, do we, did you take attendance today? Did you check in? Did you walk in and all of a sudden, bing, you were at church today and we know that? Listen, I promise you, I think I'm a little bit smart, but I do not have a photogenic memory to remember every single face that was in the room. <gasps> oh, Sally was not in church today. <laughs> a 
Let's call her. It doesn't work that way, right? If there's something going on in your body, in your life, that you need help, you need to contact with somebody, step out in faith and call somebody. But I want to point to the posture, the posture of this man with leprosy. It says that he came to Jesus kneeling. And he wasn't coming in a begging posture. He was coming in a humility worship posture. We don't really do that much on a Sunday. Sometimes if worship will go long, maybe it'll get a little bit more somber and a little bit softer. And then maybe you'll see some of the worship team change their posture. There's five different types of worship postures that we could go through. But kneeling is one of them. But if we were on a worship night where it was a little bit longer, you might see somebody kneel down. It's a, it's a position of surrender. Surrender. This was the proper position to receive from Jesus. And so this man must have heard or seen someone else approach Jesus the same way and get a healing. So he was somewhat mimicking it. Here's what I want you to know today. Worship brings the anointing. Because worship brings the awareness of God's presence. Worship brings the anointing because worship brings the awareness of the presence of God. Now listen, we all carry the presence of God with us 24 hours a day if we are a believer. At salvation, the Holy Spirit comes and lives on the inside of us. We now embody the presence of God. But we're not always aware of that presence. Changing our posture and getting to a state of worship brings that anointing that brings our awareness. And I will tell you this, God always responds to a heart of worship. He always responds to a heart of worship. Now this man knew that Jesus could heal him. Now that wasn't the problem. The problem was he wasn't sure if he believed that Jesus would. Will you heal me? Will you do what I saw you do for somebody else? Will you do it for me? Because honestly, a man in that condition is left for dead. He's not even allowed to come beg. He's a complete outcast. He's dead to the world. He's written off by everybody. So I saw you heal the blind man. I saw you heal the crippled man. But they had some kind of rights. They had a garment that they were allowed to go beg. Me? I'm dead. I'm an outcast. I'm worthless. Are you still willing to heal me? Even me? Even the worthless of the worthless? Me? And I believe that is most people's struggle of why they don't see the blessings of God in their life. It's a word called worth. Worth e, worthy. They don't believe they're worthy, but it comes back to your personal worth. Am I worth something to God? Am I worth something? Am I worthy enough? And so sometimes we don't even ask. Sometimes we don't even approach God. Or maybe if we do ask him, it's without any faith because after all, I'm going to say it because someone said, but I don't know that you're going to do it. So we ask this question, is God willing to meet my needs? Is God willing to meet my needs? I know he can. But will he meet my needs? And I'm going to say this about this man. He lacked the full knowledge of Jesus. He knew some things. He knew that he was a healer and that he could, but his theology was off. He didn't know God's will. And that's a problem in the church. We Honestly, the church at large, the church universal, is ignorant of the will of God. And then we want to use the word of God to beat each other up and to confuse each other about the will of God. Oh, Lord. Just start talking about finances, and the church world will get split in half as to how we feel 
about what God wants from us? Huh? Does God want you to be wealthy? Well, God said to the rich young ruler that it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of the needle than a rich man in heaven. So no, God does not want rich people in heaven. What? <laughs> he was talking to one person who had a love for money over the love of God. And you want to make that your theology? Moronic theology. King Solomon said, God of all things, just give me wisdom. God gives him wisdom. He's the richest man that has ever existed. How do we not read our Bibles? How do we not, but we want to control each other. It's not God's will. No, no, you, you know who says it's not God's will? People who are stupid with their money. Right? People who door dash every meal of the day. Huh? You're not attacked. You're not attacked as long as you got money in the bank, door dash all day. But don't door dash all day and complain you ain't got no money. All right. Love you, Brett. Remember what we said last week. Jesus, uh, the, the word of God says, my people are destroyed for a lack of knowledge. It's not that we are destroyed for the devil's attack. We're not destroyed because the devil is stronger than Jesus. We're destroyed for a lack of knowledge. So watch this in Mark 141. Then Jesus moved with compassion, stretched out his hand and touched him and said, I am willing to be cleansed. I am willing to be cleansed. You see, because healing is a flow of compassion. We are to carry on that same compassion as we are in the presence of God. The more you get to know God and the more that you are with God, the more that you will operate in that flow. Spending time with God causes us and motivates us to look to help others. The problem is many of us want God's presence without his presence. We want the Christmas gifts without the Christmas dinner. No, 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 I don't want to spend time with God. Just give me the blessings of God. Give me the presence, but I don't want his presence. That's too long. That's quality time. Then I got to read the Bible. Then I got to pray. Then I got to sit there and wait for him to say something back. Just give me what I want. We want a sugar daddy, but not a daddy. Hey, somebody. Ain't saying she's a gold digger. <laughs> but I'm going to say this to you. I'm going to say this. Jesus corrects this man's theology in three words. He corrects the man's theology in three words. And if you've ever wondered, like, who qualifies to be a theologian, if you've ever studied a scripture, guess what? You're a theologian. Welcome to the club. Right, that's all it means. Theologians are the study of scripture. If you've ever studied the scripture, you are a theologian. And Jesus corrects this man's theology in three words. He says, I am willing. I am willing. I am willing. There's nothing sweeter than those three words when you've doubted even your own personal existence. This man is wondering if I'm even willing to live another day. And Jesus is willing that I be cleansed. Jesus did not leave this man's doctrine lacking. Out of his goodness, he corrected the man's theology. Why? Because the man was worshiping him. And listen to what I'm about to tell you. Worshiping is a teachable place and posture. Worshiping is a teachable place and posture, and it requires humility. Anytime I run into someone who I see that they are not a teachable person, it exposes the fact that they do not worship God. They don't. They don't. You ever met somebody who's just hard-headed, can't teach them nothing? They know it all? Yeah, 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 yeah. No, 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 no. Ah. Right. 
I'm going to try to give you advice like one time and then I'm good. Like, but it's one of those things like someone wants to act like they're so spiritual, but they're not teachable, which means you ain't spiritual. That's a front. You cannot receive from God on just any version of faith. It has to be a Bible-based faith. It has to have scripture. It has to have revelation of the word of God, okay? Jesus not only corrected the man's theology, but every one of our theology. He corrected theology universal by saying, if I am willing for this one man, I am willing for all of the generations to come. I am willing. I am willing. He sets it straight. I don't know if it's God's will. He's willing. He's willing. If you abide, uh, book of John 15, if you abide in me, my word abides in you, you can ask anything and it shall be done for you. He's willing. He's willing, but we're destroyed for lack of knowledge. Lack of knowledge. Verse 42. As soon as he was, had spoken, immediately the leprosy left him. And I want to show you, the Bible says that Jesus stretched out his hand and he touched the man, which would have made Jesus ceremonially unclean. Except for the fact that he healed him. See, there's this, there's this divide in the church again where, where churches believe like people need to get saved and get cleaned up before they can come into church because I don't want you coming to my church and like your sin rubbing off on me. As if. As if. As if, man. Think of that sin's contagious. I don't want that kind of sin sitting next to me in church. So why don't you... In the power that you possess, lay hands on that sin. No, that's too much work. That's too much. It's just easier to judge them and kick them out. <laughs> no, no, no. In the presence of Jesus, in the presence of the power of God and the anointing, it flees. Jesus did not become ceremonially unclean by touching leprosy. He changed the leprosy into wholeness. Dude walks out with Purell smooth skin. <laughs> Jesus spoke, touched the man with compassion, but spoke with authority and power. Leprosy heard the words of Jesus and left the man. There's another issue in church. Just trying to give you guys some help. Here's another issue in church. I said, you broke. Could you pray for me? Absolutely. Awesome, man. Praise God. What just happened? Wait, what? Wait, what? <laughs> nah, I prayed for you. I didn't hear you say nothing. Nah, in my head. In my head. In my head. In my head. In your head? Well, God knows my heart. God knows my heart. Pray in my head. Where in the entire Bible does it say pray in your head? You didn't pray. You thought. You thought about praying. You thought about what you would say if you were to say it out loud. But you didn't pray. <laughs> you didn't pray. You thought about praying. When you put that little emoji praying for you, no, you didn't. You thought about praying for it, but you gave me emoji instead. Leprosy heard the voice of the Lord and obey, and flee. Mark eleven twenty three. 23, for surely I say to you, whoever says to this mountain, not whoever thinks about a mountain moving, whoever ponders the possibility of the mountains of your life moving, no, the person who speaks to it, sickness, disease, infirmity, allergies, cancer, bad back, bad bones, blood disease, leave me now in the name of Jesus. Whoever speaks to the mountain, be removed and cast into sea, and does not doubt. Hey, listen, fear is not the opposite of faith. Doubt is the opposite of faith. Doubt is. Doubt is, if you doubt, you're out. Doubt is what stops faith, but does not doubt, but believes 
that it will be done. If you ever say, see, I knew it wasn't going to work. Duh. You had no faith. It ain't going to work that way. So, Jesus says to this guy, hey, do not tell anybody. Just go back to the priest, get cleansed, and move it on. According to Levitical law, the priest was the one who had cast the man out of society. So only the priest could qualify him to come back into society. That breaks my heart. That, that's, that's a shame. That a, that a priest who could have healed, shunned. I'll talk to somebody today. If you've ever been burned by a church and you've got a church burn, a church hurt, maybe you're watching online, you're like, man, somebody from the church world hurt me and I could never go back to that place again. I mean, just look at this story. Look at this story. I mean, this guy is not only kicked out of church, but he's kicked out of society by the church. And is right outside the doors of the church by the man who is the church, the bride of Christ who we are, comes to the church and receives his healing. Jesus abided within the law in order to bring this man's healing. Verse 45, however, he went out. He didn't, he didn't do it. He didn't go back to that priest. He was a little, he was a little salty. He went out and began to proclaim it freely and spread the matters so that Jesus could no longer openly enter the city. But they came to him, to Jesus, from every direction. This man's testimony impacted a city and a region to pursue Jesus. There's three things that I want you to take away with you today. Three big ideas. The first one is this. The man didn't know God's will for his life. That was one of the main stumbling points in his life. He didn't know God's will. I know you can, but will you? God's will and, and, and church people using God's will as a form of comfort can be a very, very touchy situation. 16, 15, 16 years ago, we lost our third child. I was being Michael Joseph McKelvey Jr. So excited, you know, I'm a boy. We lost our pregnancy, late term pregnancy. Crushed me, broke me. I was crying at the altar one day at church. And this well meaning Christian person put their hand on my back and said, you know what? Maybe it's just not God's will that you have a son. Broke me. Broke me. Because for some people, hearing something like that brings them comfort. To me, that brings me anger. Because you already told me something I believed about myself. I wasn't good enough for God to give me a son. I already believed that. I already believed it. So for someone to say, well, it must not be God's will. Yeah, you know what? I must concur. He must not. And I'll never, I'll never be good enough. I'll never get there. Broken. Broken, man. I, dude, I'll tell you, I wanted to leave the church. I want to leave my family. I wanted to just go. It hurt me so bad. Not, not even so much the situation, but yes, the situation. But then, but God's not on my side. And God's not a good God. Because that's not a good God. To not want me to have good things. So one night I kind of ran away from home. I was a grown man, ran away from home. <laughs> I'm crying out to God, I'm upset. And God said this scripture to me. He said, I've given you the desires of your heart. Oh, I got so mad. No, you did it! Given you the desires of your heart. Oh, you did. I don't have a son. Like, who am I going to give my guns to? Who am I going to teach how to go fishing? Who am I going to teach to go hunting? No, you didn't. No, you didn't. 
He said, read it again. Open up my Bible. Open my, well, not my Bible, but I opened up my phone and went to the Bible app. Read it again. I have given you the desires of your heart. No, you didn't want to break my phone, but it's too much money. I'm not going to break my phone. <laughs> read it again. Then all of a sudden, the scripture was rewritten before my eyes. In my heart, I had a revelation. And here's what I saw. The desire that you have to be a father to a son, I put it there. I gave you the desire that's in your heart. I gave, I put that desire in your heart. I put it in you. It gave me this confidence and this joy once again that it was not a God saying no to me. It was an enemy trying to distract me and ruin my life. Throw me off track. Throw me off base. But you know what? I didn't know God's will at the moment. I didn't know God's will until I got a revelation of God's will. That every good and perfect gift is from above. But the devil comes to steal, kill, and destroy. But Jesus has come to give life and life more abundant. If it's good, it's God. If it's bad, it's the devil. Number two, Jesus corrected this man's theology in three words. I am willing. And what he did was he aligned his will with his word. He aligned his will with his word. You will never know what God's will is until you know what God's word says. You just can't. You just can't. So we can't have his presence without his presence. We can't have his presence without his presence. Because his word and his will align. So I'm not going to ask for something outside of his word. I've asked for all these things. Listen, listen. God is not going to give you something that's going to ruin your life. All right, all right, let me break it down. Let me break it down, okay? I'm not going to have my, my nine-year-old son go move my car into the garage. <laughs> my car is good. My son is good. These are all good. My garage is good because I don't have him move my car, Right? It would be foolish, unwise, and dangerous for me to give the keys to my of my car to my nine-year-old son to move a car who can't even touch the pedals. God is not going to give you whatever you ask for if it's going to destroy your life. His word and his will align. His word and his will align. Number three, the man approached Jesus humbly and in a posture of worship. Here's what I've, what I've seen prophetically. Moving forward in the next few generations, the, the mega church, the mega preacher is no longer going to be attractive. That the holy man of one man who has to lay hands on everybody, blow on them and spit on them, the season's gone. The season's gone. What I see prophetically happening in the next few generations is with no man having to lay any hands so that no man gets credit. We're in a generation today that if there was any person who had this overwhelming gift to lay hands and everybody gets healed, we would stardom them. They would become a superstar and we would ruin the whole move of God. Here's what I see. I see that worship destroys the yoke of bondage. That it will be during moments of worship. And when I say worship, like this whole weekend has been a worship experience. The teaching of the word. When you walked in and you connected with other people. During singing, people are going to be healed. People are going to be healed. Because they were in the presence of God. And when you're in the presence of God, it brings the presence of God. When you're in the presence of God, it brings the presence of God. And so now we're in a place of surrender, we're in a place of worship, and we're humbled on our knees, and we're on our face, and in those moments God says, because I'm here, I heal. Because I'm here, I give you what you're looking for. This is what I'm seeing happening. In the next few, it could start this, I don't know when it's going to start, 
But it's not going to be about a person. It's not going to be about a holy man or a holy woman. It's going to be about a people. A people. A one-on-one with God. Humbling themselves in form of worship. Say, Lord, I surrender. I surrender my past. I surrender my present. I surrender my flesh to you. So let me take a moment and speak to your spirit. What is it that you need from the Lord today? What is it that you need from the Lord today? And I'm not asking you to sit here and try to make something up. But what's been burdening your heart? Maybe someone needs a broken heart restored. Maybe someone needs freedom from addiction. Maybe someone needs healing in their body. They've just got this chronic illness that just continues to plague them. Maybe it's a marriage restored. Maybe it's a child to come home. Maybe it's peace from anxiety and depression. If there's something in your life that you need from God and you haven't seen the victory, I'm just asking if you've approached God correctly. Have you approached Him correctly? And not not to get what you're asking from God, but to simply be in His presence. I want to give you two quick examples. I'll be very vulnerable with you. Two quick examples of what I'm talking about. So for me, when I'm going to spend a little bit of time with God, I'm just going to sing, I worship you, almighty God, there is none like you. I worship you, prince of peace, that is what I long to do. I give you praise. I just take a moment. I take a moment from my heart. And just even in that one second, you can feel a peace. It's not because I'm any kind of singer. It's because it's my heart song. It's my heart song. You got to find that thing. And well, I'm not a singer. The singing's not the point. That's just my way. It could be prayer. It could be art. There's all sorts of ways. There's there's endless ways to get to the person, Jesus Christ. But he is the only way, the truth and the life. But how you get there, (laughs) it's any way. It could be dance. It could be song. Now, once I do that, I make my request known. I'm going to show you what that looks like, too. So I'm going to sing this song. I'm going to sing a song, get into that moment. And Lord, I I thank you for who you are. I worship you for your greatness. It amazes me how much you love me. Even when there's times that I don't love myself. I could worship you all day for that. Now Lord, there are some things in my life that are out of whack. I need your help. I need wisdom. I need direction, I need insight. Would you lead me? Would you guide me? Would you direct me? Lord, there's some uncertainty. There's uncertainty with fears of recession. Lord, do we recede or do we proceed? Give us wisdom. Give us wisdom, Lord. Lord, I thank you that you hold us in the palm of your hand, that this is your church, and you said that the gates of hell would not prevail against it, and you would build it. Lord, I thank you and I praise you for working these things out for your good and your glory. Lead us. So right there, just take a, like I just took a moment. That's nothing magical, nothing even poetic. It's just me, my talk, what I'm going through, what I'm struggling with. But you start it there in a posture of worship. You enter his gates with thanksgiving, into his courts with praise in that worship. You make the request known, and then you close back out, thanking him and worshiping that it's done. I don't have to keep going back and begging for the same thing. Now, the second time I pray about this, it's going to look different. 
Lord, I thank you. Thank you for what I prayed for yesterday. Haven't seen it yet. I don't have the full victory. But lead me. Show me. Guide me. I praise you for it. Remind him of it. Remind him of the word. It looks different. But don't ever doubt that he didn't hear you. Don't ever doubt that it's not his will. Don't ever doubt that it's not his word. Find a scripture to stand on. Find a scripture that aligns what you're praying for. And I promise you, in his presence, there is fullness. Fullness of the request and joy. Father, we thank you today that we could discover and discern your word. That, Holy Spirit, you would work on our hearts and you would continue to speak through us this week. As we leave here today, Lord, I think that we are blessed. We are blessed coming in. We're blessed going out. Everything we set our hands to will prosper and be successful. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for watching today's message. My name is Ashley, and if this message has made an impact in your life in any way, I'd like to ask you to do a couple of things. First, we want you to like and subscribe to our channel and join us right here every Sunday at 9.30 a.m. or 11.30 a.m. The next thing I'm gonna ask you to do is take a next step on your journey, and we would love to help you do that. You can head on over to familychurchny.com or email us at team at to get started today.